We're gearing up, of course, for our Easter services and uh, excited about next week, Palm Sunday and the week after Easter, um, just because it is, the, it is the monumental celebration of what Jesus Christ uh, came, God came to do for us. So we want to make sure we celebrate it. And next week is Palm Sunday, which is also our Evangelism Sunday. You know, we do one Evangelism Sunday a month, the fourth Sunday of the month. We're trying to get it into your head so that that's something you think about. And who could I, who could I reach out to? And who could I invite? And who could I bring? And, and uh, so we want that kind of thought pattern in your mind. And Evangelism Sunday is uh, specifically targeted towards reaching lost people and, uh, and, and loving them and ministering to them. And so that's our Evangelism Sunday. That'll be on Palm Sunday, and it'll be an exciting Sunday next week. As, uh, and as I'm already thinking about uh, the message that God really wants us to share. And then Easter Sunday will be an incredible time for us to gather. And part of the reason why is that we're endeavoring to reach all of our congregation to at least attend on Easter Sunday. And part of that dynamic is, that here's why people don't know each other in our church family. The average attendee actually attends only twice a month. In fact, out of our workers, we find that our ministry of helps attend, uh, a third of them only attend once a month. That's the, the, the day they work. So we're, we're working on this say, how, how can we engage people more into our fellowship and gathering? Jesus said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see the day approach. And boy, the day's approaching. Would you agree about that? So we want to engage people. So Easter, we're sending out, and you'll get one because you're part of, in Easter, you'll get a, a flyer from us that's encouraging you to come on Easter Sunday. We're only sending them to our, to our congregation. We're not, we're not reaching out to other people um, who don't have a church or have other church. We're just reaching out to our own church family. And that's 1,500 people. That includes children and, and adults. That's 1,500 people. Now you say, well, is our church that large? I know, right? Because, they, you know, you have the average twice a month or, or once a month, you know, and so you don't all see them and say, well, won't we be kind of full that Sunday? Yes, and do you know that many people will stay home from church because it's going to be full? They say, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to come and have to look for a seat. Oh, gag me with a place setting. <laughs> I was, I was in a, I was in a, um, a little a church in Europe, in a, Romania, uh, years ago, and I remember when I came there, I walked into the house. The reason it was in a house is because, not because they didn't have a building, but they were meeting secretly because of communism, and so the, their names were on rolls, and police watched them, and so I was snuck in, and, and I came into the house, and when I came into the house, there was no room anywhere. It wasn't a very big house. Maybe a two-bedroom house. I don't know. I didn't look at the bedrooms. But we were gathered there sort of in the kitchen, the living room. They were in separate rooms. I mean, people were sitting on the floor. There wasn't chairs for everybody. They were so hungry uh, to hear the word of the Lord. And the house was packed. And, you know, I don't think one of them said, well, I thought about not coming because it might be no place to sit. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to hear Jesus. So, uh, so encourage. You might know some people that don't, uh, that don't come regularly. You're like, oh, I know some of those Two, two Sundays a month, people, or one Sunday a month. I need, to, I need to really encourage them to be here on Easter. And the reason why, I mean, if we're going to celebrate the incredible redemption of Jesus Christ, shouldn't we all be together to celebrate it and, and, uh, and, and hear the word of the Lord to us in Jesus' name? Nudge your neighbor and say, don't be a lazy Christian. Go ahead, just, uh, just uh, don't be a lazy Christian. How many brought your Bibles this morning? Oh, we got, we got Bibles in the house. I love it. Matthew 16 is where I'm going to preach from today because the whole theme of the Bible is redemption. Everybody say redemption. I mean from the beginning of Genesis, that's what Genesis means, beginning, to the end of Revelation, which is the, quote, revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is in every book of the Bible. This is how we got the canon of Scripture. If Jesus ain't in the book, it didn't make the canon because the Bible is God, Jesus, speaking to us. The Logos become flesh and dwelling among us, the word of the Lord. So Jesus is in every book of the Bible because he is God 
coming to redeem us. Now, here's what redemption means, and I want you to get this thick into your, uh, your mind. It means to regain something that has been lost. Redemption means to regain something that has been lost, and to redeem it, a payment must be made. A payment must be made. That's how you redeem it. In other words, the debt must be cleared to get it back. That's redemption. So if Jesus came to redeem us from sin, we lost something because of sin. What is it that we lost? Jesus came to reclaim that for us. And a payment had to be made to clear that debt. Have you ever heard songs, you know, and hymns we sing, you know, sin is the debt I could not pay? Jesus Christ came to eliminate that debt. So that's what redemption means. It regains something that is lost in exchange for payment to clear a debt. As long as there is an outstanding amount of money on your credit card, you owe a debt. As long as there is a mortgage holder of your home, you own a debt, a debt that has to be paid. It's not until you pay off that note that you have the full and clear title to that piece of property, whatever it is, land, vehicle, whatever it is that you've loaned money for. Then you have clear title deed to it. No one can take it from you because there is no debt. You don't pay the debt, someone can take it from you. Hmm? Yeah, they have ownership over it unless, you, unless you're paying. Jesus Christ came to clear the debt. He came to wipe away the debt that you owed so that Satan could no longer judge you. That no longer any judgment could come on you. Now think about this. The four Gospels are interestingly unique in and of themselves. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them emphasizes this Redeemer in a different light. For instance, in Matthew, the emphasis is the King. The star from Jacob. Numbers 24. The scepter from Israel. Verse 19. Scepter, King. The one who would sit on David's throne, Isaiah 9, 7. The government will be upon his shoulder. He's a king. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Why the lion? The lion is the king of the jungle. King. He's emphasized as a king. It took a king to redeem us. In Mark, Mark emphasizes that he's a servant. Wow, what a variation. King servant. Isaiah 53 reminds us that he is bruised for us. He is wounded for us. The punishment of our sins is on him for us. He's the servant. There is no genealogy in Mark's gospel. The genealogy of Jesus of kingship goes all the way back to Adam in Matthew. Mark has no genealogy. Why? Nobody ever kept track of a servant's genealogy. It's unimportant. Mark has no genealogy. There's no mention of his kingship in Mark. He's the servant. In Luke, Luke's gospel emphasizes the fact that he's the son of man. We don't think much about that term because we think of it as being human. But the Son of Man is actually a prophetic phrase for Messiah. God who would come in human form, Son of Man. It's first mentioned in Daniel when Daniel prophesies about the Son of Man who is eternal, who exists forever. A man who is eternal? Son of man, he calls him. Also known as son of David. Both references, son of man, son of David, refers to the Messiah, the one who would come to redeem. Isaiah said he would be born and he would be given. 
He would be born man. He would be given God. God would give himself. For God so loved the world, he gave. Isaiah said he'd be born and given. Only Luke focuses on... Only Luke focuses on the incarnation. No other gospel writer focuses on it. He traces the geone- ge- geology. He traces the genealogy of Jesus through Mary and Joseph, all the way back to Adam. He's the Son of Man, the second Adam. John. John's gospel is unique in that he emphasizes son of God, equal with God. That's what it meant. In fact, Jesus never denied he was equal with God. He called himself son of man. He also referred to himself as son of God. They said, how dare you make yourself equal with God? Jesus never denied it. He didn't say, well, I'm not really equal. I'm just the son. No, Son of God was divine. He is God. He is the Word of God, John says. He is the Word. He was the Word. He was in the beginning. He was God. And then the Word became flesh. The exact way that Jesus reveals Himself is the exact way that Moses had God revealed to him. Who are you? Moses had. The father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is your name? So that I may tell the people who you are. I am that I am. I am ever eternal, present. When they asked who Jesus was, he said, before Abraham was. I am. They were insulted by it. How could a human being, as they saw him, be I am? King, servant, son of man, son of God, savior, redeemer, Lord Almighty, the one who comes not to destroy, but to serve, to save, to redeem. The world you and I live in is actually ruled by Satan. No one likes to talk about it. No one even mentions it. Very few churches even talk about it. But God is very clear that the world that you and I live in is ruled by Satan. The God of this world. Jesus referred to him as the prince of the world. Paul said he's the prince of darkness. The rulers of principalities. The governing influence of the world. John wrote later, the whole world lies under the influence of hell. Jesus said, I have come into the world, but the one who rules it has nothing in me. King, servant, son of man, son of God. Job is the first book written in the Bible before the the first five books that Moses wrote. He was after Moses, but his book is the first recorded. Interesting enough that Job actually talks about the devil in like coded form. He doesn't understand the thief that's broken into his life. He doesn't grasp the significance of this prince who is bringing destruction into his life. His cattle are stolen. A storm comes and destroys the home where his children are. They're killed. Everything begins to go awry. Then his servants, his employees, they're killed. More assets are taken. You, it just, everything seems to go wrong at once. And Job, Job, Job doesn't understand there's an influence, a darkness that's working against him. He said, I need, listen to this, I need an umpire. <laughs> I need an umpire who can decide between me and what's going on around me. Someone who can bring me peace, he said. Someone who can stand between me and God. 
Here's how Job 19.25 said it. Listen to it. A guy who didn't even... I know that my Redeemer lives. In all my destruction, I know that my Redeemer lives and He will redeem me. Wow. And, and God did. Remember Job got twice back what he had. Twice. Not just what he had. Twice. God is a twice redeemer. He brings back to... This is why the Bible says the last days of the body of Christ will have a greater glory than the first. Nudge your neighbor and say, it's going to be best. Yeah. When you don't know this, when you don't know this, you read the Bible and you're like, what is all that stuff going on? What are they killing all these animals for? And why do the priests have to go through all these rituals? I mean, they got to wash and then they got to put on clean linen and they got to take the clean linen off and then they got to wash again and they got to sprinkle blood on this, sprinkle blood on that. What is going on? And then we read these stories in the Bible and we're like, what is that story about? When you remember that God is the Redeemer and you read the Bible in the light of that redemption, even the flood makes sense. Because God had said to Adam, I will send a seed of the woman, a virgin born man who will crush the lordship of Satan over man. Man had become so corrupt, the Bible says, every thought in his mind was to do evil. Satan was ruling all over man. How could God bring a redeemer in that line? He found Noah who was righteous in the sight of the Lord said no I got to keep you alive for a righteous line for my redeemer to come from here's what I want you to do build a boat it'll be a type of Jesus the one who saves redeems only make one door because Jesus is the only way to the father no man comes to the father but by him put one light in the top one skylight in the top of the ark so that the only place you can look to for help is up. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. I look into the heavens and to the hills from whence comes my help. Everything in the Bible has redemption all over it. <laughs> when you don't understand this, you don't understand evil because you don't think that, you know, it's like, why do bad things happen to good people? Because everybody's under the judgment, that's why. Satan rules over the earth, and if people don't know it, then, then they don't understand why these bad things happen. The Bible says when God created the world, it was good. There was no evil. Satan came in and brought evil and sin. Isaiah writes of him, Satan, the deceiver of all of the nations... And when they see him, the nations see him, Isaiah writes, they will say, is this the one who destroyed us? In other words, there's nothing glorious or powerful about him. He's a deceiver. And the world will look, is this the one who deceived us and destroyed us, who made our lives a destruction and made our lives a wilderness and kept us in chains and bondages? Wow. Paul writes, Satan is at work in the earth to keep you in the darkness so that your eyes remain blinded so you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. Redemption is truly revelation. Or revolution. <laughs> it revolutionizes your life. 
because it takes you out of sin and its judgment and gives you an authority over any debt. So when the credit card company calls you and says, we're going to repossess you, say, no, 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 I have receipt. It's been paid for. So when the bank calls you and says, we want your car, because it's not, no, 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 I have receipt. It's already been paid for. You stand up with an authority and say, you can't take from me what has been paid for, and you can say to hell itself, you cannot take from me what Jesus has already paid for. Wow. Sometimes we find this, living in this darkness without this revelation, we find ourselves drinking the sewage of the world. The filth and the and the dirt and the corruptness of the, of the world. Oh, we try not to. You know, we try, you know, we think if we can just be good enough, you know, we, we feel like then we can make it. But your goodness doesn't redeem you, my friend. It's kind of like the man who was attempting to siphon gas from a motorhome that was parked along the side of the street there in front of the guy's house, you know. And he got, you know, the inclination, you know, I'm, I'm going to get me some gas free. And so he got a whole lot more than he bargained for. Apparently, he didn't know where the gas tank was. When the police arrived at the scene, they found a very sick, coughing, spitting up man curled up next to the motorhome with spilled sewage around him. The man admitted that he was trying to steal the gasoline, but he had put the siphon hose into the motorhome sewage tank by mistake because it was dark. Of course, as he tried to... Siphon that out. Well, I don't think I have to get into any more detail. The owner of the motorhome declined to press charges, saying it was the funniest thing he had ever seen in his life, and he thought the perp had been punished enough. Sin is like that. Sin is like that, and what seems to be the thing that we want, desire, that we're chasing after, actually is sewage to our lives. And it sickens us. And somehow the reward that we thought we would get, we don't get, and we're like, what did I get into? Matthew 16. That's where I'm going today. If you haven't found it by now, give up. If your tab didn't get you to Matthew 16 by now, it's just too late. Just forget it. Look on with somebody else. Jesus is near Magdala with His disciples. This is where Mary of Magdala, Magdalene, came from. With His disciples, many people are around Him, right? And they're they're coming because they want to be redeemed from sickness and disease and infirmity and paralysis and deformities. The Bible says crowds of people are bringing their lame and their blind and their maimed and the mute and all kinds of diseases and sickness and Jesus is healing them all. This is in Matthew 15, 29. He's redeeming them from such horrible invasions into their physical bodies because that's what He came for. Why did He heal so many people? Because He's a Redeemer. Why did He restore so many people? Because He's a Redeemer. This is what He came for. Not only has He redeeming them from all this sickness and disease, He's feeding them thousands of people with a boy's lunch, bringing supernatural provision to them for their lack of and their need. Where there is no food, he makes a way, multiplying a little boy's lunch until such a degree that not only do thousands of people eat, there are 12 basketfuls of food left over. My friend, God wants to redeem you from any lack. He wants to redeem you from your want. He's the Lord, our shepherd, I shall not want. That's a redemptive verse. 
And God is saying to you in all of your struggle and all of the things that are against you and all the things that could go wrong and the business doesn't have enough people and the product's not selling or the, the wage is not enough, how do I, God, how do I survive? Wait, wait, God can multiply your seed sown. God can multiply a little boy's lunch. God can multiply the things in your life until there's such provision you got basketfuls left over. This is not, quote, a prosperity message. Oh, curse those people who think that only all God wants to do is give them money. No, no. God wants to make provision for you. That's part of his redemptive plan. Nudge your neighbor and say, it's going to be best in this last time. Go ahead, tell them. Jesus is not only feeding the thousands of people, he's demonstrating continually, listen to it closely, he's demonstrating the will of God for you to be redeemed. A man even came to him who was sick, ill, and said, God, I know you can, Jesus. Son of man, he called him, I know you can. Fell to his feet and worshiped in Matthew 8. He said, I know you can, but will you? Jesus said, of course I will. Why did Jesus say that? Because the Father wills to redeem us. In doing so, we see these enormous miracles, amazing miracles happening during the ministry of Jesus. The Bible calls it signs and wonders. My friend, there are all kinds of signs for redemption that man is given. This is why Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature and I will be with you and signs will follow you. <laughs> You and I are in the sign business. Hmm? God wants to do miracles in your life. So, chapter 16, verse 1. You ready? One day the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus to test Him. These are two religious groups, Sadducees and Pharisees. The Sadducees were, well, basically they were priests who ministered in the temple area. They were very well-to-do, upper echelon, Jewish aristocracy is what you could call them. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they were so sad, you see. Oh, man. Pharisees, they were men of economic classes of every people. But they were very rigid in their adherence to the law of Moses. So much so that where there was ambiguity in the law, they would write even stricter laws of man where the law was ambiguous. They believed in spirits and angels. They believed in the resurrection from the dead. They believed in the afterlife. So here you got these two contentions. Verse 1. So the Sadducees, Pharisees, come tempting Jesus, desiring Him to show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered them, said, When it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it'll be bad weather today, for the sky is red. And hovering, red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. All right, where do you think this came from? Verse 3, Jesus said, you hypocrites, you can see or discern the face of the sky, but you don't discern the signs of the time. Now, the Word of God is actually filled with signs. They're full of it. Signs about God's will, signs about His desire, signs to redeem mankind all the way through the Old Testament. Over a 4,000 year period of time, that's how long the Old Testament is, God tells us that He's going to come to earth to redeem man from sin. Because of the wages of sin, it will take death. Death is the only way to get rid of sin, but not your death because you are full of sin. So your death means nothing. It doesn't stop sin. It will just be the reward or consequence of sin. But Jesus said, I will come to redeem you from death. I will die for you. This is redemption. So God gives a sign. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. This will be a sign unto you. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they'll call his name God 
with us, Emmanuel. This will be a sign to you. Zacharias writes, this will be a sign to you. Your king will come riding to you on a donkey, the foal of an ass. And the people will cry, Hosanna, 400 years before Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. God is giving signs. Signs. The one who's eternal, the one who's from everlasting to everlasting, he'll be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Daniel writes, he'll be called son of man, and when he comes, he will be cut off from his people. He'll be killed. Signs are everywhere in the gospel. Signs are everywhere in the Old Testament. I'm going to come and die for all mankind. I will suffer for all of his griefs, all his sorrows, all his sicknesses, all his pains, all his poverty, all his chaos, all his fears, all of his torments. I will go to hell for him. I will be raised up from hell to life and I will conquer hell and death for I am coming to redeem you. So Jesus says to them, you guys are blind. Anybody think sewage? You guys are blind. You forecast weather, but you can't even see the signs about me that are everywhere. A wicked and adulterous generation will seek after a sign, and there will be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he walked away. What's the sign of the prophet Jonah? 780 years before Jesus Christ, the Assyrian Empire is ruling over that region, over the world. It was a cruel, aggressive, and wicked empire. Its capital city was Nineveh. It was the most influential port city in the world, like what we might think of as New York, although it's not the most important port city anymore. But we think of it in that term. Most influential Nineveh. It's full of lies and liars in its government. It's full of human trafficking and rape and violence and cruelty and murder. It's full of witchcraft. It's full of sorcery. And it's full of addiction. Full of addiction to wine and the drugs of its time. Do you know after ISIS is defeated and ran out of Mosul in 2017... Archaeologists discovered the many tunnels that had already been tunneled out and ISIS kept tunneling. Probably they were looking for artifacts they could sell in the black market from the Assyrian Empire that they could fund their terrorism with. But they had also broken and destroyed and looted many of the things that verified the Bible. Both to sell in the black market and to fund their terrorism and destroy this pesky little book that they say has been corrupted by them Jews. But in the tunnels were discovered engravings that verified the accuracy of, of kings that First and Second Kings writes about that had reigned in Assyria, which the Bible actually records but nobody had ever found proof of some of those kings. Some of them, yes, others, no. They said, well, see, the Bible can't be true. The word of the Lord can't be true about that because we can't find any documentation or verification that these kings even existed. But in those tunnels, they found them written on all the walls, all the kings of Assyria, back to Sennacherib. And many of the kings that the scriptures listed <laughs> that were not in what we call history until they found them in the tunnels. Tunnels, why, why would there be tunnels? Because in, in history, what you find is people build on civilizations, right? Why do they build on civilizations? Well, because where they usually built was probably a resource there, either water or some sort of... So when it gets destroyed, they just rebuild on it over and over again. When you, when you go over east, uh, you will find this in all of Europe. You'll find it in all of the Middle East. You'll find civilizations built on civilizations. Sometimes 
20 different civilizations. And as they dig down, they, they find it in the earth. It just gets, you know, covered up, wind blow, etc. Here in these tunnels where, you know, pillars, where old buildings sat of the Assyrian Empire and on them listed all the kings. Why, why do I just mention that? Because what God says about redemption is true. What God says about kings is true. What God says about you is true. What God says about him coming again is true. What God says about him delivering you is true. What Jesus is saying is that he is going to be swallowed up and crucified and I will descend into hell, the bottom of the earth, and he will cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then God's right arm will raise Jesus to life again. And Jesus says, the only sign that will be given to you is the prophet Jonah. Hmm. The prophet Jonah, that little three-chapter book, not very long. And what's it tell us about Jonah? He was three days and nights in the belly of a whale. Three days and nights in the belly of a whale, Jonah said, I will sacrifice to you again with thanksgiving and praise. While Jesus is hanging on a tree, he said, but you are holy, the one who inhabits the sacrifice of his people. Jesus is repeating in Matthew 16, what he had said to another group of Pharisees and Sadducees when the crowds were complaining that they were calling him Son of David, Messiah, the one who comes to redeem us. And Jesus says to them, you want a sign? No sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and nights, so the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Messiah, shall be three days and nights in the belly of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and they will condemn it because they believed Jonah and they were redeemed. But I tell you, a greater than Jonah is here, and you have not believed him. The Christ who came to fulfill God's law and promise to redeem you is now telling the Pharisees and Sadducees, you're drinking sewage. You got your hose in the wrong place. You don't believe what you can see right in front of you. You want some sort of magical sorcery sign? I'll tell you the only sign that you're going to see is what the prophet already declared, that a redeemer would come. He would be swallowed up by death. He would be three days and nights in the belly of the earth by death. And then he would rise again to life. And that well spit Jonah out to life. Do not think that Jonah lived in that belly of the well for three days. He didn't. He died. He said, it's all around me. The depths of the earth are all around me. I cannot see life. Life, he said, the darkness swallows me up. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then God said, it's enough. Spit him out. And that well spit Jonah out on the sand seas of Babylon. And he comes marching into the most wicked city of Nineveh. Can you imagine the seaweed around his breath? The pitch skin after he had been spit out of the well. His skin would be all white and scaly. Dragging seaweed with him and said just a few words. Repent or God got to kill you. Oh, you bet we will. Huh? But Jesus said, I come, I come as a babe in a manger. I come as an unpretentious person whom you don't know and whom you don't see. And I come to die for you and take you out of the whale's belly so that you can live and redeem your life. And you still won't I admit I'm just getting wound up, but i got to stop. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, this name that's above every name is called such because it redeems us from every other name. It redeems us from torment, from 
375 different named fears. It redeems us from want and lack and that horrible thing of poverty that makes you feel less than a person. Scraping and always worried about what will I eat next? How will I live? Redeems us from such invasive things into our bodies, plagues and illnesses and so many things that the world is full of because of hell and Satan. I thank you, God, that you don't rule by sickness, you rule by mercy. You don't rule by hate, you rule by love. You don't rule by fear and doubt, you rule by faith. It's like such opposite. And you've come to redeem us. May we not be like these Pharisees and Sadducees who can't believe in the greatest sign ever given to us of mankind, but instead bow our knee and say, God Almighty, you are my Redeemer. And I declare my debt is paid for Jesus Christ has paid my debt. No invasion of hell can come again to my home. It must pass over. When it tries, it must leave, for it has no right to stay. And in the name of Jesus Christ, that name above every name, I am free, delivered by the power of that sacrifice. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want you to stand with me and I want to, um, I want to pray a redemptive prayer over you. And so I'm, gonna, I'm going to have you actually pray it with me, but not for yourself, for a person next to you. And uh, that's why it has redemption written over, all over it. When I speak it, you'll, you'll recognize the words. Oh my gosh, that's redemptive. He, I'm gaining back what's been lost. This is why the Bible says what the thief takes from you must be replenished seven times. It's all redemption, right? How'd you like to be healthier seven times more than you are right now? Amen. Right? How would, you, how would you like to have God's presence, His peace, seven times greater than when you lost His peace and feel like you're far from Him? <laughs> Stretch out your hand towards a person. You can touch them if you like, but... Be thoughtful about that, would you? And, uh, and just as a hand laid on them. Part of the reason that I have you do that is the Bible really speaks about you can transfer a blessing by laying on of hands. You can transfer healing by laying on of hands. You can transfer a prophetic word over a person by the laying on of hands. There's something powerful about human touch that God transfers His Spirit and power through us. Remember how many people wanted to touch Jesus whom he wasn't touching because there was a transfer? That's why I'm having you do what I'm doing. And I want you to pray this out loud. Say, in the name of Jesus, I call redemption over you of wholeness, of strength, of restoration, of any evil that has tried to Usurp its will over you. I command it broken off of you and it must leave. And the redemption of Christ fills you full of His glory, His presence, His peace and restoration in the name of Jesus I call you whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a redemptive prayer. That's what that is. Glory to God.